Hi, and welcome to Drafting Compliance. I'm Kane. He's Tom. And I, I, I've noticed, Tom, this is our sixth episode of Drafting Compliance. Um, there's that many Star Wars movies, right? Oh, at least. I mean, it depends on what you consider canon in Star Wars, right? So if you're gonna if you're gonna take into account the animated movies and you know, so, some I mean, of the, the Christmas special maybe, Christmas but after special, the one with the sure. Ewoks, it's pretty much just they're dead to me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, today we're talking about. Uh, let's see. Last, actually, last episode we talked about the incident response policy and uh, the incident response control family. Today we're talking about awareness and training. But as always, we're also talking about beer, Tom. We are always talking about beer. You know, we had a little bit of mix-up in our in our beer uh, delivery service, so we didn't get in sync. So I I thought we would try one of the sort of mega craft beers out there. So this is Sierra Nevada, which is a unbelievably good brewery. If you are not familiar with Sierra Nevada, it's in California. I think it's in Chico. Yeah, Chico, California. They make a number of really great beers. So today we're drinking Hazy Little Thing. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you beforehand, Kane, this is something that's in my fridge almost all the time. Okay, got it. Um, This has never been in my fridge before, but I will say I like the, I like the petite size compared to some of the other things we've had on the show previously. I approve of this size. Yeah, these are sensible 12 ounces. It's 6.7% ABV. This is what is known as a New England style IPA. That so sounds it's gonna, familiar. It's going to be hazy and a little um, balanced with like a citra. Oh, and here you are pouring it already. Okay, I am already pouring. All yep. right. Well, okay. I was looking at it and thinking, okay, well, at least it's not as dark as the last one. Or I couldn't. Well, even I found shine with my you, Kane, that, dar- that darkness just doesn't matter. It's all. It's all going to taste like something bad to you, I think. But I would be curious because I've drank this several times. I would be curious for your um, your nose on it and kind of what you see and it smells like oranges. Yep. Yep. You're going to definitely have a, a citrus. oranges and like I don't know maybe some a pineapple. What is that? Star anise, maybe and. Something else there too. Not it's not pineapple. It's more peach for me. Peach, yeah. I always oh. think it has a little bit of a like an overripe pineapple smell to it. But overripe pineapple. You're not really selling me on this, Tom. I... Yeah. You know how they get how pineapple gets really sweet and squishy yeah. when it gets a little overripe. Yeah. That's what it nasty. smells like to me. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Thanks Again, a beautiful head on it. That. It's it's you know it's very hazy, so it's it's not like a lager that you can see through. Let's taste it, because I'm excited. I want to know how you what you think of it, Kane. Okay, I'm going to be calling your baby ugly yet again, Tom, I suspect. Let's, let's see how this goes. There's a lot of foam on the top. No, that's just straight foam. I should get a straw. Is it, are straws okay? <laughs> Beer through a straw is not okay. Okay, fine. I'll try the liquid again. Will come, the liquid will come through the foam if you tip it. There you go. That's the best face you've made yet. Drinking I was thinking beer. when when you when you drink a lot of red wine, you get acclimated to tannins and how you know some have sure. more bite and they're a little drier than others. Um, I don't know the terminology here, but this is not as beer like as the other beers. Um, it doesn't have that. Oh, this is beer to it. I don't know how. I'm I'm probably doing a terrible job of explaining it, but it's got a similar feel to it. Like this is closer to a, like a rosé in terms of beer as opposed to a red wine. It's thank goodness not a white wine because you know that doesn't exist till Memorial Day. Um, but it's not. I'm, it's I'm not encouraged. massively offensive. Yeah, I'm encouraged. I mean, typically New England style IPAs are very balanced. It's usually balanced with a citrus note of some kind. It's usually quite hoppy, although this one is not by any means the hoppiest um, IPA that I've ever had. Definitely a balanced. peach peach aftertaste, which I guess if you're good with peaches, it's fine. Like this, yeah. This is yeah. This is way All better right. than that. This is better than that pecan pie one that they lied to me about on. 
Awesome. Which, well, I'm going to mark this as a win. We'll, we'll, we'll hold off on, on actually rating it. but uh, <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, in the meantime, we're here today to talk about the, um, the awareness and training. And I think the first part of this, the easy part of it, Tom, is to really write a policy um, for awareness and training, right? That's correct. And I, and I will say in terms of policy writing, which I've done a lot of in my career, and I assume you have done as well, this is one of the easier policies to write. There's not a lot of meat to consider. You have to define essentially what you're doing for new users, what you do for existing users, how often you're doing it, and then you define the types of training in which you're going to provide those two groups. So it's not particularly burdensome. I think in terms of our policy language, even with all of our standard bits and pieces, this is about a three-page policy, which, uh, you know, if you know policy and there's lots of standard language in it, that means it's a pretty short pretty short policy. Well, I don't know. I mean, I've always felt that if I could get policy into a tweet, like the 280 character tweet, like that would be <laughs> ideal, but I have yet to get it that small. And mostly that's because governance, less words mean it's easier to pass. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. There are, you know, in all FedRAMP policies, there is standard language that you have to have in it. You have to have roles and responsibilities defined. You have to have management commitment defined. You have to have your review schedule for the policy defined. You have to have non-compliance defined. So all, but of, all these... of that's boilerplate, right? I mean, if you can, yep. if that's at least yep. two pages of boilerplate, I'm, I'm hearing the rest of this is still quite succinct. You got it. It's very succinct. And then to your point earlier, the real burden of this policy is in the execution. So you have to, you know, much of your policy, once you, you configure it or much of your controls, once you configure it, it's just you monitor to make sure your configuration doesn't change. With security awareness training, you have to do this on a reoccurring basis. You have to refresh that, the, the type and content of that training pretty regularly to mm -hmm. reflect changing threat landscape and in, you know, perhaps new tools in your environment and those kinds of things. And then you have to follow up to make sure that those users are all getting that training at the appropriate time and completing it within the appropriate window. So you know, when I was, I was reading 853A beforehand, which is my cheat sheet, really, for getting ready for this show to remind myself of what's in. And it's not only security training, and it's not just administrators, which is what people might initially think, but um, there is security training in there. There is privacy training in there which I'm sure our attorneys who watch the show would be excited about. But there's also uh, APT literacy, advanced persistent threat literacy. And that needs to be disseminated, not just to system administrators or system users, but it also has to go to, um, I think it's managers and senior executives. Well, right, Tom? That is correct. We, we take a much broader approach. So we provide what we call basic security awareness training to everybody, everybody in the organization. So anybody gets the same level of training at that level. That includes APT, that includes um, insider threat training, that includes information spillage training. It also con includes conceptual big concepts in, in security training as well. Um, we have a module that we push out that is sort of what are the main threats that you should be worried about. And the nice thing about all of that kind of training is it's useful outside of the company as well. So oh, it's really good for your, your user base to take that training in general. Yeah, we but define... beyond that, though, I just want to rotate back on, on uh, you said, insider threat training. Because if I recall, 853A, which is the basis of examination for FedRAMP, or at least it's the easy basis, um, you, you actually have to test people for their awareness of social engineering and insider threat, right? That is correct. And social so, engineering is a fairly easy, like I, I think everybody in the audience probably has seen a fake phishing test and they've received right. the, the nasty gram or the positive reinforcement that says, oh, no, you got fished. But how are we going to test for awareness of insider threats, Tom? Yeah, that's a good question. There's several ways that you can test it. The, the, the first and easiest is you can do um, st standard campaigns and you can reach out to a number of different companies that will do standard campaigns. Basically, what they're going to do is they're going to act as if they are an employee. They're going to send uh, emails with um, potential damaging data in it and try to cop ask that person to move that data someplace to the outside. Um, so th that's just an example of a campaign. 
you can run those campaigns yourself. But the idea is you have to make sure you have some methodology for that training and you track it. But not only do you track the, that you've given the training, you track all of the employees that have taken that training. So there's an attestation piece to the training as well. Right. And we also, just to rotate on to the administrators, they, they actually get more training, right? They get role-based security and privacy training, if I recall. That is correct. So we've essentially defined three levels of training in our organization. We have basic security awareness training. That's what, what I described. There's critical system training. So that's people that have access into systems that not everybody in the company would necessarily have access to. Uh -huh. So we give some best practice training on those systems. And then we have security role-based training. So anybody who has a security role, including people that are on the CERT that may not look like they have a security role. So the CERT is the security incident response team. All of those folks will get additional training. That training looks like um, basic training on our security uh, incident response process, um, understanding of why they might be a particular target um, f from an outside threat, you know, when you have, when you have certain roles within the organization, you become an elevated threat, um, target. So we train them on that as well. So it's just, it's just a additional level of diligence for people that have a larger role in terms of security awareness. And that sounds like there's also some um, some interplay there because in our prior episode, we talked about having an incident response policy and incident response procedures. So it sounds like by training people on our incident response procedures, we're actually satisfying some of that role-based security training for our administrators, right? That is correct. That is absolutely correct. So what's interesting is when you start to think about the members that you have on, say, a CERT team, a lot of them are not what you would typically think of as an information security person. So for instance, you might have your legal head in your organization on that team because you want to have somebody who reads all of the communication that goes out and also touches base with, uh, with the legal representatives of other companies. Well, in that case, that person is certainly not a typical information security person, but that person does have the need to understand what are the risks associated with this role. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other thing yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about, I was, I was pausing there. Um, I remember, and I, I might not be accurate on this one, um, but I think FedRAMP Moderate has a requirement for physical security controls. And given that we are uh, a cloud-first organization and we're really using a lot of, you know, almost exclusively cloud technologies, it's not like we've got some data center somewhere. Um, right. If that's in there, how are we going to actually address a requirement for training on physical security controls? That's a great question. So you're referring to the physical and environmental protection section of controls inside of FedRAMP, which is a whole <laughs> nother family than security awareness training. Right. In, and I'm actually writing that policy right now, so I'm pretty familiar with it. So that deals with a whole bunch of bits and pieces that we don't necessarily have in our environment but you might have in your environment if you're a different kind of company. How we are handling that is we are talking about what the controls should be and we're talking about how those controls are satisfied in a cloud environment. So we have those all satisfied and we can attest to it through our FedRAMP um, partnership with say Azure or AWS, right? But we're so, not just saying, hey, no, doesn't apply to us. Like we're not using a does not apply or a not applicable correct. phrase in this section. Okay, good. So we are, because I imagine that uh, assessment organizations, a 3PAO might look at that and go, yeah, no, tell us more. Correct. So we want to tell them more ahead of time. We want to try to cut off those conversations. And Absolutely. then in terms of, of how do we train on that, right? There are some pieces that you want to pull out of physical and environmental protection and still think about in the world of cloud. So you still have, just like you have lessened access to your physical data center, you have lessened access to your virtual data center, which is in our case, Azure. So Azure has a, a um, umbrella council for configuring new assets and deploying new containers and all of that. You know, we still provide controls to that area that we don't right. provide to, or that we would provide similar to in a physical uh, data center. 
And then we train on the policy. So all of our policy gets pushed out to the folks that need to understand and read it. Mm -hmm. So policy becomes a piece of our training um, strategy. So the other thing that I know that's in there, and I'm thinking of training on policies myself, um, we're required under FedRAMP moderate to collect training feedback, not just attestations that they read the policy, not just a, uh, I don't know, some marker showing that yes, they played through, they scrubbed through to the end of the video, but we're actually supposed to collect training feedback on whether or not, you know, they liked it and they thought it was useful or maybe not so much. Um, how are we going to, how are we going to approach that, Tom? Are we going to use some kind of system? Or are you just going to take like, are you setting up an inbox for this? How's that going to be addressed? <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And it's important to understand that, especially at scale, managing your training program becomes somewhat of a burden if you don't try to automate some pieces of it. So I recommend using an LMS, a learning management system. Mm -hmm. That learning management system will present your training. It will track the training, meaning it will understand what percentage of your organization has taken it and who has and has not. But it will also provide all of the mechanisms uh, mechanisms for attestation and feedback. So if you have a good LMS system, you have that built right into it. If you have, if you happen to not have an LMS system, you're going to have to track that another way and it's going to be manual. So you're likely going to have things like a sign in form, digital or, or physical, uh -huh. and you're going to have a feedback form, digital or physical, and you're gonna have to collect all those, organize all that and put it into proof for when you get audited. Right. And then it's, it's, and you said when, not if, which I kind of love about that attitude of, right. of we are building a machine here to be able to collect proof and present that proactively to auditors and assessors. Correct. Correct. And in, in, an, in our instance, you know, we use, um, we use our own platform, Hyperproof. And so I have connected Hyperproof directly to our LMS system and it pulls all that proof for me. Fantastic. So that's less burdensome for you. Although now we, you might have to ask people like, what did you think of the training? What did you really think? Tell me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, so, speaking of I getting into say, opinions, you know, we should probably get to the beer review. I'm just looking at the clock here. Don't want to keep on everybody here. Um, yeah, can we I'm move ready. to beer reviews? I'm so always I think, ready. So how much of yours did, did you finish? I'm looking at my. Oh, I've been, I've been steadily sipping. Oh, so. Jeremy, no. Yeah. Okay. You, no, you know, for a beer that you like, you haven't drank in a lot of it. Let's let's take well, one more final draw, just so we get a good, a good okay, feel let me, for let me it. Let cleanse my palate we... here. That's a good beer. You know, it's the nose of it has changed. Well, it's gotten a little warmer. It's less fruity but... on the nose. Actually, I'm not detecting the um, the citrus anymore. The pine, the 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 overripe pineapple still comes through. You know, the, the, the characteristics have changed. I, I liked it more than now, weirdly enough. Like, hmm. when this was just opened, it had a, a light, fruity, interesting kind of bouquet. Now it, it just kind of reads beer. Interesting. Like, yeah. It, it, like I get a tiny amount of peach, but it's not nearly as interesting as it was previously. Um, I'm, again, it's not... It's not mortifying. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a four, four out of ten. I am so happy to hear we've moved off of twos. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe if we leave this out for another hour, it's going to be a two. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. So I've already, you know, tipped my hat a bit. I keep this in my refrigerator pretty regularly. If it's not this, it's something that appropriates uh, really close to this. So I'm going to give it an eight. This is my favorite style of beer by far. And I will say even if in the in the variety of this beer, there's lots of variations. So be, feel free to reach out and try them all. Kane, I think you might find one you actually might rate even a six. I don't know. <laughs> so. Well, you know, not that I'm keeping count, but if this is episode six, this means I have 18 more beers to try, Tom. So uh, <laughs> we're going to find that one perhaps in the meantime. But for those of you who are still watching, um, thank you for watching the whole episode. Uh, please do like and subscribe at the end if you want to see uh, both our FedRamp journey and to see do I ever find a beer that's higher than a five. 
I don't know if I'll ever get to an eight like Tom, but uh, with that, thanks again for watching, everybody. Again, this has been Drafting Compliance from Hyperproof. I'm Kane. He's Tom. We'll see you again in two weeks. Thank you.